I wanted someone to actually see me for who I was. If you can't love and support them as they are, you should not be parenting them. They need to feel accepted, they need to feel cared for, they need to feel safe. The most fundamental quality that I think is critical for resource parents is empathy. Don't judge me, especially being LGBTQ. We're looking to be loved and accepted. Yeah, acceptance is really huge. Listen, ask questions, affirm that the child knows who they are. If you show just a little bit of supporting behaviors towards your child, that could save their life. Just imagine if the families that are so distressed when they learn that their child is LGBT and they say, uh, this isn't what we expected, it's wrong, it's against our values and beliefs. Imagine if they stopped and said, we didn't know anything about this. This is all new to us and we love you. We're gonna be there for you no matter what. We're gonna learn about this together as a family because you're so important to us. This is Core Teen, right time training for resource parents. In this episode, we focus on sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, SOGI for short. We'll learn from professionals what resource parents can do to support adolescents who identify as LGBTQ. As an LGBTQ child, you're constantly trying to figure out, am I safe? Can I tell the truth? We'll learn from veteran resource parents the difference family acceptance can make. Who you are at the core of your being is someone who is worth knowing, worth loving. And we'll listen to the voices of youth. To listen to them, that's the biggest thing. As we explore acceptance, what it means, how to show it, and why it matters. LGBTQ2S um, stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, and two-spirit youth. Lesbian is a term to describe typically um, women attracted to other women. Gay is typically a term used to describe men attracted to other men or women attracted to other women. Um, bisexual is a term that's used to describe someone who has attraction for their own gender and then another gender. And then transgender is a term that's used to describe someone who has a gender identity that does not match the sex assigned at birth. Questioning is a term that we use to describe anyone who's developing and they're trying to figure out exactly where they are. Two-spirit is a term that is used by some Native American communities um, to describe someone who identifies or feels like they inhabit both the male and female spirit. SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Expression. There is a distinction between sexual orientation and gender identity. Likewise, Gender identity and gender expression are two different things. So we've started using the term SOGI, or sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression to really encapsulate everyone's sexual orientation and gender identities, because that's something that everyone has. If a person is heterosexual or straight, that is their sexual orientation. They're not really left out of the acronym. And when we're talking about marginalized groups within that, we often say, young people with diverse SOGI. Sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. We all, as human beings, have a sexual orientation. When we say sexual orientation, we're talking about people's inherent attraction, which includes social attraction, emotional, spiritual, intellectual, as well as physical and sexual. We all have a gender identity which is intrinsic to who we are. Do you feel like a woman? Do you feel like a man? Or do you feel like maybe both or none of those? And so there's lots of different types of gender identities depending on how the person feels about themselves. Sometimes that aligns with biological sex and sometimes it doesn't. And then how we express that truth that we feel inside about our gender becomes our gender expression. How we dress, how we wear our hair, the colors we choose. 
What we all really need to understand about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender identities is that, that they are simply a natural part of the continuum of ways that we all as human beings identify ourselves, live out our lives. When I came out, my parents, you know, said pretty much like right off the bat, you know, we still love you. Um, and they said that it didn't change anything, but what they said afterwards um, didn't really indicate that. And so I think um, my mom said something like, I'm never gonna be a grandmother. And then um, my dad <laughs> said something along the lines of like, it could be worse. So, <laughs> so at the time, um, at the time that was, that was hurtful, and I think, um, I think that was a sign to me that I knew I never doubted that they loved me, but I think those those sort of like contradictory statements they gave was also a sign of like, oh, okay, we're gonna be in for some rocky stuff. When I was younger, um, I was out to my father. He was the first person I came out to, and his response was more neutral. He didn't kick me out of the home. It wasn't extremely rejecting. But the first thing he said to me was, don't tell anyone else. And so what he was trying to say in that moment, now that I understand is, I don't want you to get hurt. So that was his intention. The impact of him saying that was, he, my read on that was that he was ashamed of who I was. He was embarrassed. Um, he didn't know if he quite believed me and didn't want me to share information that that would be difficult for a family to hear because that would make him uncomfortable. Um, and so the result of that is I didn't really talk with him about it again. Well, they can't know. They're just confused. They'll grow out of it. One of the largest myths that people believe is when a child, because they're a child, um, that identifies as LGBTQ, they feel that the, this identity is um, a phase. And that's not true. When you think about any, anyone who identifies as heterosexual, and, and I ask the question, when did you first become aware that you were attracted to the opposite sex? The answer is usually somewhere around 10 to 13, which is the age of puberty. And in fact, a child can know by the age of 10 to 13 whether or not their natural expression of who they are is gay, lesbian, bisexual. I knew when I was very young, like probably about eight years old. I found out I was gay when I was about 14. My son already knew who he was when he moved in. He, he knew he was transgender, he knew he was gay, but he had never been allowed to be transgender or be gay. Most of my childhood, I was a boy. Um, my grandparents saw it before I did, uh, but I started self-identifying, I think, as early as like fourth or fifth grade. The truth is, a six-year-old can know that there's some mismatch between their gender assigned at birth and the gender identity that they experience and feel inside. I told some treatment staff and I think another foster home, and they literally like shunned me. So. Resource parents need to be able to suspend judgment and, and to hear the truth that a young person brings forward, regardless of their age. One of the common misconceptions is that this is a choice, and often using the word lifestyle, that it is a chosen lifestyle. Um, for myself, um, as a gay man, I can assure you that I spent 17 years married to a woman. I have three adult children, five grandchildren. I spent a lot of time and psychic emotional energy doing everything I could to not be who I am. Being LGBTQ is not a choice. It's who you are. It's intrinsically who you have developed to be. If they're not sharing that they identify as LGBTQ until they're older, it's not because someone is choosing it, it is because they might not have had the words 
or the safe environment to come out. I think that one of the most important myths that needs to be dispelled about LGBTQ youth is the idea that their sexuality or gender identity or gender presentation is always going to be at the forefront of whatever's going on with them. Just because I'm 15 and I came out as a lesbian or as transgender does not mean that I'm not still worried about my friends or that I'm thinking about my grades or everything else that's going on in my life. I'm still just a kid with a bunch of other stuff going on. This also brings me to another myth, which is that a lot of people think that if someone shares that they're LGBTQ, that that means that they have had sex, um, which is not accurate. A lot of folks assume that children who have had um, experiences with abuse, specifically sexual abuse um, or non-consensual sexual experiences, that that is the cause or reason for their LGBTQ identity. That some kind of abuse is like what caused them to identify as LGBTQ. That that's why our SOGI is so diverse. We often hear people telling young girls who come out as lesbian, you just think you're a lesbian because you had that traumatic experience with sexual abuse when you were younger and now you don't trust men. That is then just creating this perpetual loop of trauma and telling someone that who they are is tied to that experience of trauma, which is completely inaccurate um, and very damaging. The social and cultural messages that we get as young people that are negative about LGBTQ identities or people with diverse SOGIs, really often those messages are ones of you are deviant in some way. There's something wrong with you or you have a really sad life. That having a diverse SOGI um, is a type of perversion. If you have an identity that's in the minority, if you are lesbian, gay, if you're bisexual, if you're transgender, anything that's not of the majority is often portrayed in the media and through a lot of other lenses widely as being something that is negative or bad or wrong with someone. Uh, when we really should be looking at the negative thing is the discrimination. Somebody having an identity of saying, I'm bisexual, that is who I am, that's a very, that's a positive thing. That's a piece of someone's identity. Sometimes parents think that that means their child can't get married or that their child can't have children and that they won't get to be grandparents. So you have one lane if you're, if you're straight and you have another lane if you're LGBTQ. And, sh and for, for her, it was like, oh, all these opportunities that she thought that I would have are now gone. And so what we have to tell young people is that there's a place for them, that they belong, that they can have a future, that they can have a good life. And one of the powerful findings of our research is that when young people are accepted by their families, if I could show you a chart right now, you'd see it up at the pinnacle, that those young people believe that they can have a good life, a positive life as an LGBT adult. There still is a prevalent belief in U.S. culture and really around the world that these identities are causing harm to the child and that it is the identity that's causing depression, substance use, risky sexual behaviors, that it's inherent in the identity so the identity must be fixed. We now have research through the Family Acceptance Project that makes it clear that LGBTQ children growing up in accepting family environments do not have any higher incidence of suicidality, depression, mental health issues than the general youth population in the United States. Where these issues show up is in LGBTQ children who are being abused or neglected or fully rejected by their families. Family acceptance is protective against suicidality, against substance abuse, against depression. I like to say that family acceptance is like a vaccine that protects your child with love. As an LGBTQ child, you're constantly trying to figure out, am I safe? Can I tell the truth? What are the signals that I'm reading in my environment? Just based on my past history of 
rejections and trauma. I knew even just just from being bisexual that like I was never going to be truly accepted and loved. And even though she was really forward about being in support of gay marriage, you know, there was just kind of like one kind of offhand comment she made once when I was like 15. She said, I don't really think bisexuals exist. I think they're just horny and would have sex with anything. And then she never got to know my identity until I was an adult. So think twice. Maybe listen before you, you know, my, my great grandmother used to say, close your mouth and open your ears. And that's for grown ups too. That's what you need to do. Pay attention. Your words matter. And you know, one day we finally had a conversation about it and I mentioned, you know, you said this thing to me once and um, it just made me scared to ever disclose to you. Like even though I know what your values are, like it, it made me feel as if that could be like the thing that, you know, either makes you perceive me differently or gets some of my privileges taken away from me. Uh, and so I didn't let you know. Your behavior has this critical impact on whether or not these kids do well. Everything we do for, about, and around children contributes to how they turn out later. For families and, and caregivers of all kinds who want to make their home feel supportive to an LGBTQ, there are some nuances that are really important to pay attention to. For example, um, instead of asking young people if they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or if they like a boy or a girl in their class, just leaving it really open. Do you like anyone? Um, and being okay if that answer comes back different than you expected. When those youth come into your home, asking what their preferred name is and what their preferred pronouns are, letting them know what your preferred name is and what your pronouns are. I think to youth, especially to LGBTQ youth, they'll know that that means I'm in a place that isn't making assumptions about who I am. Having some sort of visibility in their home, whether it's an LGBT rainbow flag or a trans flag, uh, having books that are about LGBT topics. And I think remembering that youth coming into your home may never have um, identified as LGBTQ to us, to anyone, but when they feel comfortable and safe in your home, they will. These are children who are vulnerable on so many levels, who have already experienced trauma of being removed from their home, of having a lot of transitions and instability. They feel rejected and they can't be who they feel like they want to be. I think foster parents need to know that when you accept a young person, you make them feel like they belong, that you make them feel like they're okay, there's nothing wrong with them. Listen to them, that's the biggest thing. Um, I didn't have people listening to me. I'm an LGBT youth, uh, I identify as a transgender male. So my last foster home, they did not really see eye to eye with that. It didn't come up too much other than around like prom time and haircuts, like they didn't, they don't want me to have a mohawk, um, but I got it anyways. They didn't want me to get tattoos, but I got three while I was there. Sometimes the desire to protect a child comes across as disapproval. Prom was probably the biggest issue. The words said to me by them were, if you wear a tux to prom, you will be, uh, you will be an embarrassment to our family. And that like really hurt. If they had just said, I really care about you. You're going out at night. It's in a tough part of town. It's not really safe for you to be alone in those parts of town. Let's talk about what it means to be out in the world because I love you and I care about you. No child wants to feel alone or not loved. So that's the worry we worry about. We worry that we're gonna lose any acceptance or any understanding or any support and we're gonna be left all alone. I like women and she didn't want to accept that, you know, she was like, that's not, the Bible clearly states that that's against it. And then she started trying to pray the gay away. I'm not going to tell you you're bad and that you're dirty and that you're going to hell. That is not unconditionally loving. She tried to send me to counseling. My mom, like, she was like, well, maybe this is a phase or um, she sent me to therapy before and also boot camp. She tried to basically, you know, tell me, well, you can't leave the house, you can't have company here. Another thing that's critically important for parents to do is to be willing, if the child has LGBTQ friends, um, allow some of their friends to actually be present with them in your home. Provide safe space. Another one is is just is transparency and truthfulness. 
it's vitally important. A young person knows when you're uncomfortable and they know, they perceive your judgment whether you ever use words or not. It is really much better for them if you're willing to say, you know what, I'm hearing you and I love you and I'm struggling right now to understand. Be honest. Absolute silence and ignorance of the child's identity, it is every bit as oppressive and develops as much fear in a child as someone who overtly says, you need to stop that. You can't go out dressed that way. This needs to stop. I think that there are small ways that parents can show that, um, that the LGBTQ identity is not invisible, that they understand it's a part of who the child is. Even if it scares you, even if it makes you feel like, what am I going to do with this? I don't know how to respond to this. Young people don't necessarily need you to respond. If you're able to sit quietly, ask questions, and simply let their responses be, you will build trust. They will feel safe. They, they listened to me. I think they, li I think they gave me space to be able to talk about where I was and what I was feeling. And also, to, I think, especially to be able to talk to them about how coming out was really good for me and they didn't, you know, they didn't like interject or be like, oh, but what about these other things? They just, they just really listened to me. Um, and I think they also wanted to know about my life. So like, was I dating anyone or did I have any, like, what did my friends say? So they, they still wanted to, to uh, know about my life. And so that felt uh, really affirming. One of the most important things that parents and caregivers can do is to talk to their child about that child's experience. That's one of the basic building blocks of the supportive and accepting behaviors that we've identified and measured in our research. And you know what? That's a behavior that anybody can do, even if they think that being gay or transgender is wrong. It's okay to say, I don't understand some of this stuff. It's a lot. But also to say, maybe you can help me understand it. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You don't have to choose between your child and your values or your child and your faith. That there are so many ways that you can be there with your child, increase the level of intimacy, and just imagine if the families that are so distressed when they learn that their child is LGBT and they say, uh, this isn't what we expected, it's wrong, it's against our values and beliefs, I don't think you can live here anymore. Imagine if they stopped and said, we didn't know anything about this. This is all new to us and we love you. We're gonna be there for you no matter what. I really believe it's empathy and listening. It's, it's really, it, it is, it's suspending judgment in the moment, listening carefully, eye contact, being present, and at the end of it, being able to say, I love you. I love you.